will each Megan and I will face to face introduce ourselves briefly and then we'll show you a, a PowerPoint presentation. But I'm Janelle, I'm from Ogallala, Nebraska, and I've I currently live in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I've lived here for about 13 years. And hello, this is Megan Lyons. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. Obviously, I moved here from the southeast. Um, I escaped sea level rise and hurricanes, but am still surrounded by extreme weather events. So I was very surprised to move from the mountains to the coast to the prairie and see the effects of climate change. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now, just a moment. Here we go. Okay, can we see the beginning of this, Tony? Um, hold on. Yeah, I can see other it. people. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, Megan and I are the Natural Resources Co-Directors of the League of Women Voters of Nebraska, and we're going to give a brief presentation um, about climate change and hopefully some action steps that we can take from here. So first up, the big question, what is climate change? Um, this definition here is from the agency who develops climate assessments for our nation. Um, I would encourage you to check out this website here that's that's on the slide and I'll let you read this definition yourself, but um, we know that we won't be able to cover everything on climate change in this presentation. This is the tip of the iceberg, if you will. Um, some of this information is a little more relevant to our area or region, the Midwest. So I'll move to the next slide where we will show the League of Women Voters position on climate change. Um, so this is our position here summarized and we want to emphasize that an international approach is necessary to address climate change. Um, climate change is not a political issue, it affects the whole world, so we need all countries to get behind this um, to combat it wholly. Um, the League supports science-based action and we understand that there are many layers and groups to consider when developing plans of action to combat climate change. Next slide. Um, some big causes of climate change. The first one here, the burning of fossil fuels such as coal produce large quantities of carbon dioxide. The next one, deforestation or the permanent removal of trees takes away the plant's ability to perform photosynthesis, which enables them to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The next one, land use change. An example of a land use change might be developing a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a natural prairie habitat into a monoculture crop or the cultivation of a single crop in a given region. And then the last one here, um, methane from fracking or the production of natural gases. So I'll go to our next slide here. Some destructive effects of climate change and um, some extreme weather events that we might see would be the increase in temperature, droughts, heavier precipitations, intense storms, flooding. And I know that when we hear droughts and flooding in the same sentence when describing this might sound counterintuitive, but we'll kind of describe that in the next slide. Some other um, big ones here that we see on the slide here are species extinction and the extension of wildfires in, in all areas that, that we've been seeing in the United States. And then uh, food and water scarcity. And I'll go to the next slide here. So next, I want to 
um, share something Al Gore describes very well. He gives a brief but thorough overview of how climate change works. Um, energy from the sun reaches Earth in the form of light and heat energy. Some of that energy is re-radiated and some is trapped like in a greenhouse. More carbon emissions lead to more heat being trapped within our atmosphere. Heat also goes into oceans and disrupts the entire global water cycle. And most of us are familiar with the Midwest flooding in 2019, but I believe in 2012 there were also droughts. So we've seen those extreme weather events here and throughout the world. I want to look at a few maps very quickly um, to consider what will climate change mean in Nebraska, but also other areas of the Midwest. If you look at the average temp uh, winter temperatures today in Nebraska, they look like this on the map from December to February temperatures average in the 20s. But on the next slide, um, you'll see current climate models use mid-range projections. Um, this is assuming that we start now to reduce carbon pollution. They project that winter temperatures will gradually rise by three to five degrees Fahrenheit by around 2050. So um, that would give Nebraska community similar temperatures to what you see in Kansas now in winter. Um, so the key thing to look at here in red, if you see now, Scotts Bluff, 27 degrees. Um, the projection is 2050. The average winter temperature would be 30. And that's not including highs and lows. That's the average. And the last slide, um, as far as these projections, these same models project that average summer temperatures in Nebraska will increase by five to six degrees by 2050. So again, if you look in red where Scotts, uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska is located, 71 degrees average in the summer, like right now, we're in the middle of it, by 2050 that average could reach 77. So if you think about that increase, um, Nebraska will have summer temperatures similar to what Oak Oklahoma and Texas have now. So you see Kansas would be there in the middle, um, but we would see a shift in, in most summer temperatures. And that's where we think about drought, disrupted water cycle again. Um, this next one, progress across economic sectors. Um, we realize causes and effects problems and solutions when talking about climate change, but how about looking at current solutions we can support? Um, we are making progress across economic sectors to solve economic and climate-based problems. So for example, this first one, the energy sector needs to divest or move away from burning coal. An example here in Nebraska is that Omaha Public Power District has announced they will be net zero carbon production by 2050. Another example in transportation is to um, get an electric car. And then the last one here in, um, in building would be LEED certification. And LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And they are a green or sustainable building rating system. Go to the next slide here. And here are two areas that need more focus on progress. Our agriculture and lands need more than sustainable approaches. We need a shift toward regener regenerative practices. Um, next, our most vulnerable citizens continue to face injustices, extending from patterns of racial bias and environmental jobs to the legal case of Juliana versus the United States. The League of Women Voters of the United States was one of the first national organizations to stand with the 21 youth plaintiffs in court for the right to a climate system capable 
of sustaining human life. Okay. And we're ready to move to the next slide. All right, there we go. And so some response options or really resilience building activities. What can we do? Um, so two key terms to think about or ways to think about action are adaptation and mitigation. So adaptation is to um, adopt to what has happened and um, improve what you can with it from there. And then mitigation is the action of reducing the severity of something. So reducing the emissions of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in some way. I'll move to the next slide. A global youth climate leader, Greta Thunberg, has simple but powerful messages. And a couple of those include protect, restore, fund, vote for people who defend nature. We can do this. <laughs> and next one. Next slide, please. Yep. The project drawdown framework stops climbing levels of greenhouse gases and starts steady decline by reducing carbon use, supporting nature's carbon cycle and carbon sinks with a critical third social component to improve society. Um, regenerative farming and ra ranching in the Midwest accomplish these goals through soil conservation and restoration. We are making progress. And then um, what else can we do? More that we can do, local and national action. And you're probably familiar with these general action items such as supporting eco-friendly legislation, calling, emailing, writing letters to your senators. Um, I know I've been nervous about calling my senators sometimes, but, but usually a legislative aid answers and they take all your information and um, shouldn't be afraid to, to call and do those things as often as you can. And then, um, as a matter of fact, Megan and I and other members of the league are working on a, a specific legislative bill, LB 283. And um, it's a, a climate change study and action plan for Nebraska, looking at the economic, social, and natural resources impact. So that's something that's coming up here. Our legislature is going to reconvene for Nebraska in uh, July 20. So uh, after this weekend, we need to get to some talking points and what we're going to call our senators and, or what we're going to ask them to support LB 283. And some final thought, thoughts from League of Women Voters. At our national convention recently, I learned to broaden my perspective beyond climate. It doesn't fit in a box. Climate change affects the economy and in turn affects human rights. For those changes and effects to be positive, everyone needs a seat at the table. For example, for racial justice to improve, climate justice must be part of those solutions. Solving these intersecting problems may require changes in our morality, and a great place to start is with nonpartisan partnerships, integrating advocacy, voting, and faith. And then at the end here, we have lots of resources that I, th I think we'll be able to share with the group after this whole meeting ends. So um, we'll, we'll be able next, to do that. Our next speaker will be Chelsea Johnson, Deputy Director of Nebraska Conservation Voters. Okay, I'm going to see if I can share my screen.
Janelle, can you see my screen? Yep, you look good. Okay, um, well, first, just thank you to the League of Women Voters for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, we love working with the League of Women Voters, and um, it's one of my favorite organizations to be part of in Nebraska, so thank you. Um, like Megan said, my name is Chelsea Johnson, and I'm the Deputy Director at Nebraska Conservation Voters. And to first just tell you a little bit about myself, um, I am originally from Johnson, Nebraska, which is a small town in the southeast corner of the state, um, very agricultural, just like the rest of Nebraska. And when I uh, was a kid, I grew up out in the country and I spent a lot of time outdoors. Um, we had a natural spring fed creek out in our pasture and my mom used to take me and my best friend down there all the time and I just thought it was the coolest thing to feel that cold water coming straight out of the ground and to see the dragonflies playing in the water and um, I just grew up with a really deep love of nature but when I was growing up we also didn't spend a lot of time talking about politics in my family um, and so I never even considered that the environment was at risk, um, that the water that I played in as a kid could potentially be polluted. Um, and I didn't know about climate change until I went to college and I learned a lot more about um, the environmental issues that affect our world and our state. Um, but perhaps what was most impactful for me um, and got me involved in this work that I do now is that my college years actually coincided with when the Keystone XL pipeline first became an issue. So I was able to get in on the ground floor of helping to organize opposition to Keystone and spent several years um, heavily involved in that and that is actually how I first got um, introduced to the League of Women Voters. And I see a lot of familiar faces on the call um, from that kind of initial foray that I had in protecting the environment. Um, and one of the biggest takeaways that I had from the Keystone Pipeline fight was just how few local elected officials there were who were concerned about the environment um, and who were going to stand up against um, this threat to our water. Um, there were hardly any natural resources district directors, hardly any public power uh, district directors, and very few state senators who were concerned about the impact of the Keystone Pipeline. So that was um, really enlightening for me and highlighted that there was a gap um, that needed to be filled in terms of protecting the environment in Nebraska. And so that is why my executive director and I decided to get the Nebraska conservation voters back off the ground in 2014. Um, NCV, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, um, and we focus on educating voters, advocating for sound policies, and electing conservation champions. And since 2014, we have focused our efforts primarily on clean energy and water quality. So I'm going to just talk really briefly about how we've been able to affect positive change on clean energy in Nebraska through our election work, as well as spend some time discussing water issues in Nebraska and the opportunities that exist there um, for everyone here on this call today to have an impact in protecting our water. Um, so for starters, Nebraska has a history of really loving coal. Um, we still today get almost 60% of our electricity from coal um, and between 2000 and 2015, Nebraska's carbon emissions actually increased more than any other states. Um, during this time, our carbon emissions went up by 22%. 
and the next highest increase was Mississippi at 0.8%. And every other state decreased its carbon emissions during this time. And kind of the main reason for that is while most other places in the country were already kind of starting to transition away from coal, um, Nebraska was building a coal plant. Um, Nebraska built one of the newest coal plants in the country during this time. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is how over the last um, few years we have worked to transform Nebraska from being um, super committed to coal to being on track to make significant advances in clean energy. Um, including in victories that happened just last year. So despite the fact that our state is still heavily invested in coal, um, we have always had a ton of clean energy potential. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this map before. It's of wind resource potential in the United States. Um, Nebraska is of course right there in the middle of some of the heaviest wind resources available. We actually rank third in the country in our wind potential, um, and we also rank 13th in our solar potential. So we have a ton of renewable energy potential that we could be capitalizing on to not only um, transition Nebraska away from fossil fuels, but also um, help other states in the country in their clean energy transitions as well. So, you know, why, what are some of the reasons why Nebraska hasn't already become a leader in clean energy? And a lot of that has to do with um, just the fact that the folks who were in leadership positions um, of our state's public power districts for so long uh, were very anti-clean energy, very pro-coal. Um, this is just a few of the leaders of our public power districts um, over the last several decades. And um, oftentimes these folks just had been on the board for a long time. Um, they often ran unopposed. And, you know, like I said, they just didn't really see much uh, potential for clean energy. And they were really um, stuck on believing in coal and seeing that coal was the future for Nebraska. So um, when we got started at NLCB, we decided to change the status quo um, and started to get involved in recruiting candidates and supporting candidates who were going to be better on clean energy. So um, over this time period, we've helped elect, um, and we've also um, increased the diversity in the folks who represent us. So. In this time period, we've helped elect the first um, gay city council member in Lincoln, um, which is important. Um, Lincoln city elections are important because the mayor of Lincoln and the Lincoln city council is in charge of appointments to the Lincoln electric system board, um, which is who decides um, Lincoln's generation mix. Um, we've also helped elect more women than have ever served on public power boards before, and we've supported Democrats, independents, and Republicans. Um, so we have really focused on changing these elected boards so that they better represent Nebraskans. So to kind of go a little bit deeper into what public power is, um, we're the only state in the country that is 100% public power. So we elect the people who make decisions about how we get our electricity. Um, there are three main uh, public power districts in Nebraska. There's the Omaha Public Power District, uh, Nebraska Public Power District, and like I already mentioned, Lincoln Electric System. So directors for OPPD and NPPD are directly elected. Um, those folks show up on, on our ballot in November. And so um, we, you know, directly choose who represents us on those two boards. Like I mentioned, um, for Lincoln Electric System, uh, those directors are appointed by the mayor of Lincoln and confirmed by the Lincoln City Council. And so those are the elected officials that we have focused on in Lincoln. 
Um, so starting with the 2016 elections, we prioritized winning clean energy majorities on these three boards. Since we got started, uh, we have been involved in 20 races and we've won 80% of them. So we have seen a, a dramatic shift in particular on the OPPD board. Um, and we've started to see a shift on the NPPD board and the LES board as well. Um, and we are already starting to see the policy impact that that has had. Um, you know, in the last few years, NPPD and OPPD created their very first community solar programs, which has resulted in more than a dozen new solar projects in our state. Uh, no other state saw more growth in wind power than Nebraska did in 2018. And um, as was already mentioned, last year the OPPD board made a zero carbon commitment. And OPPD is one of the only utilities in the entire country to do so. Um, there are many um, cities and states that have made that sort of commitment, but for a utility to make that commitment is a really big deal. Um, so, you know, it just demonstrates the impact that having more representative leadership makes um, in these public bodies. And in Nebraska, we have more of a, um, we have more power to make a difference than uh, many other states do because we do elect our public power representatives. Um, some of the work that went into all of this, um, in the last few years, we've held over 900 events um, focused not just on clean energy, but also water quality, um, pollinator habitat, um, a wide range of environmental issues just to raise um, consciousness of environmental issues in Nebraska um, and to really educate voters to be more concerned about the environment in general. Um, we've knocked on nearly 400,000 doors all across the state and we've sent more than one uh, and a half million pieces of mail. So um, now, you know, there really is a bright future for clean energy in Nebraska. There's certainly still um, a lot of work to do, and um, but it's certainly a lot more hopeful now than it was uh, five years ago. So when it comes to water in Nebraska, um, we have a long way to go in terms of protecting our water quality. Um, as well as our water supply. So 85% of Nebraskans get their drinking water from the ground. Um, unfortunately, uh, water pollution is a pretty big problem in Nebraska. Um, so according to the 2018 Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality report, 83% um, of lakes and 39% of stream miles were impaired, which means that the water quality does not meet the state requirements for at least one of its uses, which can be recreation, drinking water, irrigation, or the support of aquatic life. And some streams had multiple impairments. Um, a 2014 report found that Nebraska's waterways were the sixth worst in the nation for toxic pollution. In 2018, 40% of surface water samples tested had nitrate levels at or above 10 parts per million. The EPA has set 10 parts per million as the maximum safe limit of nitrates in drinking water. And in each of the last three decades, nitrate contamination in Nebraska has doubled. Uh, so that is also not great. Uh, nitrate ingestion has been connected to um, various types of cancers, blue baby syndrome, birth defects, thyroid disease, and macular degeneration. Um, and right now, UNMC is conducting research into the connection between 
high nit nitrates in Nebraska's groundwater and our state's high rate of pediatric cancer. Um, so a lot of times we hear about how Nebraska has all of this um, water available to us. You know, we're home to the Ogallala Aquifer, um, which is a huge water resource for us. But while we do have um, a lot of water available, we are seeing that um, it is becoming contaminated um, and it's being contaminated more and more every decade. However, um, similar to the way that we can make a big difference on energy generation in Nebraska through our public power districts, we also elect um, the people who are in charge of managing our groundwater in Nebraska. Um, we have a unique system of water governance. Um, we have natural resources districts whose boundaries are determined by um, river basins, which is different than what you see in most other states where um, natural resources are governed by political subdivisions that follow county lines or some other sort of kind of arbitrary political boundary. So the fact that our districts are drawn um, in this way does provide an incentive for these NRDs to work together to ensure that we are managing our water resources um, from a more holistic perspective. Um, and it incentivizes us to just work together more. And that has had a positive impact, um, particularly when you look at depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer, um, where you see in other states depletion happening really rapidly. In Nebraska, for the most part, um, we actually don't see that. We see that our water level, for the most part, has stayed um, pretty, pretty straight line. Um, the southwest part of the state is really the main region where we're seeing um, more significant depletion happening. Um, but, but in regards to water quantity, the NRD system has really helped quite a bit. Um, but again, in terms of water quality, that is an area where we do still need a lot of work to be done. And that's also an area where um, the NRDs have kind of fewer tools at their disposal to really have an impact because when it comes to quantity issues, um, NRDs are able to kind of um, impose restrictions on irrigators. And um, if they choose to um, impose punishment, if uh, there is like an overdrawing of, um, of their water allocation in a given year. But when it comes to water quality, um, that's where who is on the board really makes a huge impact um, because it's a bit more um, discretionary in terms of managing quality issues. So an example of that is, um, so the Lower Platte South NRD, which covers the Lincoln area, um, we actually have a whole um, soil health program where we provide incentives for farmers to use cover cropping and plant pollinator habitat. Um, the North Platte NRD actually has similar programs, and there's a couple of other NRDs as well who have programs like that, but that's not um, common to all NRDs across the state. Um, and when it comes to getting involved in the NRDs, there are a lot of opportunities to do so, um, because as you can see, there are quite a few NRD boards all over Nebraska, and, um, and there's a lot of seats on those boards. So right now, uh, in this year's election, for example, there are 142 seats up for election um, across all of the state's NRDs, and that happens pretty much every two years, um, because you know it rotates how many seats are up. So uh, nearly 150 opportunities every year to get involved um, in this way to protect our state's water. So um, 
yeah, that pretty much concludes my presentation. Um, NCD will be a resource for folks who are looking for more information about candidates who are running for um, the NRD boards as well as the public power boards when we release our endorsements later this year. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions if people have them. Thank you for this as a Nebraskan. Uh, it was really helpful for me to understand. Um, our Kansas friends, uh, is, would anybody like to just like a couple minutes? That, that was all about Nebraska and um, Kansas friends. Does somebody want to uh, just say a comment, a quick comment or two about anything that you see that's paralleling in Kansas? This is Lori, and um, I'm in Wichita. We now have a lot of wind production going into place. There's more coming all the time. We're also selling a lot of it out of state. Colorado is buying a lot of it, from what I understand. Um, my particular provider, we are all for-profit electric companies. Um, and my provider has a guarantee by the state legislature to provide a 9.4% dividend to all of their shareholders. And that's on the backs of us, the um, users of the service, the electric companies. So we are quite different in Kansas. Um, we do a lot of wind and solar is starting to take off now, which is nice. Um, my provider, and maybe Jane Burns can add to this, I'm not sure, I believe is more than 40% wind right now um, and is working its way toward more and also doing solar and providing that as a service. So our provider is really sucking us dry, but they are trying to do wind. So it is nice. Um, we are one of the top producers, uh, have the top potential of wind and solar as well, like Nebraska. And we could power the entire country, but we're getting a lot of pushback from farmers and property owners now who don't believe that wind is a good thing. And we've had some discussion in group chat about how maybe wind is not the be all and end all, but it's, we're in process. We're still trying to work our way through everything. Uh, but wind is much better than what we've got right now available to us. Um, but there's a lot of pushback. There's been a lot of propaganda out there by, I'm certain, the oil people. And you know, we're the home of Coke Industries. So we've got the Coke brothers right here in Wichita. Uh, one of them's gone now, but they're still very, very, very powerful and have lots of money. So yeah, there's, there's, they are spreading word that wind is bad and you don't want it on your land. And let's make sure we do a moratorium on it, which my county has done put a moratorium on it, and so has another county nearby. Uh, they're trying to stop it the best they, in the best way they know how, and that's with putting money toward billboards and advertising and newspapers in the rural parts of the state where they would actually institute this. Yeah. So yeah, it's been a battle here too. Okay, thank you very much for that, Lori. That was a good perspective, uh, so we have some contrast. Um, so I think we did have a couple of questions, but I think we'll save them to the end. We should have a little bit of time at the end to answer some questions. Um, so moving on, uh, now we're going to have some rest and relaxation. Um, so we're going to play a very calming video. Um, it's not really a video, it's kind of a, a still video, but you can close your eyes or whatever you'd like to do. And we will uh, do that for about a minute as just a, a brief intermission. So let me...
Okay, so hopefully everyone is um, relaxed and ready for our next segment. Um, okay, so let me adjust my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen okay? Looks good. Great. Um, okay, so um, now that we've kind of heard about the climate change issue um, and we have some background on that, now um, we'll talk about just a little bit about voting and why the upcoming election is going to be very important in pushing forward and advocating for climate change and other issues that we might be dealing with. So first, just a little background on the league's position as far as voting rights is concerned. So our mission is to empower voters and to defend democracy. So in that, we're looking to ensure that we have voter education and voting rights that are accessible and equal across the board when it comes to um, participating in our democracy. So as we all, I'm sure, are very aware of, um, 2020's general election is probably one of the most consequential, consequential elections of our time, um, dealing with systemic racism, voter suppression, a global pandemic, and obviously climate change being a major component of what we're dealing with. So voting is going to be an engaging voters, um, as well as being aware of the candidates and their platforms and positions about the issues that we care about is going to be really important. So um, voting in today's climate. So when we think about voting um, and the electorate, so there is um, a component of the electorate called the rising American electorate. And it's composed of various different demographics. And so they're going to be really important to not only educate as to the process of voting and voter registration, but also making them aware as to the intersectionality of things like climate change and how that affects racial justice and generations going forward as well. So the rising American electorate consists of communities of color, young people of all ages and unmarried women. So these are three areas of the electorate that are, have been expanding at least, until, at least since 2016, um, but maybe even before then. Um, and it's a demographic in which we have to really focus on in the sense that with the global pandemic going on, there's lots of different priorities that um, individuals in this, in this group have. And so we wanna make sure that voting and being registered to vote is one of those. So um, this just gives you a little idea of kind of more of a breakdown of those demographics. Um, so the Pew Research Center did a couple of different studies and gave some projections as to what the electorate would look like as far as the rising electorate um, in a couple of different instances. So the first graph you see here um, talks about 2020 projections as far as generationally. So if you look at the graph there, you can see that the boomer generation and generation X are kind of decreasing a little bit as far as their, their uh, the numbers of people um, that are voting and involved in the electorate. And then you see millennials and individuals in Generation Z um, increasing since about 2000. So um, that increase speaks to just the, the increase in individuals 
being able or being of age to vote, um, but it also speaks to just more engagement from that population in our voting process. Um, if you remember 2012, one of, that was one of the election years in which young people turned out pretty heavily um, in the elections. And so you can kind of see that with this graph as well. Um, the other portion is related to communities of color. So um, the Pew Research projections um, speak to the fact that Hispanics or the Latino community is projected to be the highest um, ethnic minority group as that will be a portion of the electorate in 2020. Um, so you can see the increases of that group as well as African Americans um, as being a part of the electorate. So it's just important to remember that all of these areas are expanding as far as being engaged in the electorate and how do we um, educate them on registering to vote, educate them on the issues such as climate change so that we can make sure that they're engaged. And so when it comes to voting and elections, I'm sure we've all kind of heard of misconceptions and falsehoods that people have about voter registration, about voting by mail, particularly in the current climate. And so um, with that being said, um, a lot of the voter registration and voting rights and education efforts are going to deal with um, combating misinformation and just um, the idea that the news media and other outlets are are speaking about a narrative or creating a narrative um, that would suggest that voting by mail, for example, contains lots of fraud. So you see here one of the myths is that voter fraud is very rampant. Um, and what we know by the research and the data, it's that that is usually not true. Um, this type of fraud you see there, Loyola did a study and there were 31 credible instances of impersonation or fraud out of the number of ballots cast. So you can see that is a very small percentage if it occurs at all. Um, another myth is that non-citizens are voting in droves. Again, um, if you look at the comparison and the, the amount of incidents compared to the total amount of votes that are being cast, you can see that again, it's a very like a, a hundredth or thousandth of a percent um, in 2016. So again, it's not happening in, in a rampant manner as some public officials and others might lead you to believe. Um, and then the last one listed here, and there are many more, are that people can't help people vote. So Nebraska does um, align with the act that you see listed there. So you can have family members, friends, legal guardians, and others assist you with returning your ballot, collecting your ballot, and helping you to submit it. Um, that is an opportunity. So you can get people to assist you with that. So it's important to keep that in mind when we're talking about accessibility and making sure that everyone is participating in our dem democratic process. Um, another study, um, kind of going back to the generational piece of voting, um, talks about people's incentive for voting. So why do people vote in different generations? So um, a lot of the research talks about um, baby boomers and that generation of people just having like a an internal incentive as to why they vote. They vote because they feel it's their civic duty and that's kind of their incentive to go out and vote. Um, whereas younger generations are more connected to the issues and they vote because they're passionate about a particular issue, for example, climate change. Um, and so they're going to vote and align with those candidates or those platforms that address the issues that they, they care about most. And so I think that's really important um, when it comes to the climate that we're currently in because there are lots of intersecting issues that are going on. And so we can use that to kind of leverage people's engagement in the democratic and voting process. So when it comes to the 2020 general election, um, we have some key dates and information. I won't read all of this off to you, but I will uh, make sure that this PowerPoint is available so that um, you have the dates in a specific way. So um, the things that you wanna keep in mind are deadlines for voter registration. So Kansas does have a primary coming up and that deadline is also coming up as well. So making sure that people are aware as to what the deadlines are for voter registration and the ways in which they can register to vote. So Kansas and Nebraska are pretty similar as far as the procedure that you would go through to vote. Um, you can do it online, via mail, or in person, potentially. Um, that may be limited due to the current pandemic that's going on. Um, but 
when it comes to online voter registration, at least in Nebraska anyway, um, most times you will need an ID. And so when we're talking about that rising electorate and communities of color, there are many people within that demographic who don't have IDs and things of that nature. So making sure that they know that there are other options and making it as accessible and intentional as possible in getting them registered to vote. Um, and then you also have the opportunity to verify your voter registration. So if you've moved or anything like that, you'll want to change your voter registration, but there, there are opportunities to verify that you're actually registered as well. So you want to make sure to do that. Um, and then when it comes to voting by mail. So I know um, as the Legal Women Voters of Nebraska, we have pushed for voting by mail, especially with the pandemic currently going on. That's one of the efforts that we have going on currently. Douglas County in Nebraska actually is sending vote by mail applications to all registered voters um, for the general election. Um, so we're kind of hoping to push that idea or narrative across the state. We'll see what happens with that. Um, but voting by mail also has deadlines associated with it. So we wanna make sure that people know what those deadlines are. And in Nebraska anyway, you don't need a reason to vote by mail. Um, you can make that request via application. Um, return that to your local election commission or your county clerk and get a mail-in ballot sent to you. Um, and then obviously on election day, you can always go in person to vote um, if you choose. Um, that will be on November 3rd. And I know in Kansas, um, there, there is an ID required. So you do have to have an ID when you go in to vote. Um, and when you think about voter ID and you talk about the League of Women Voters, one of the things that we uh, vehemently oppose is voter ID, and we always have. Um, there have been some litigation cases that we worked on as a league um, towards that, and in Nebraska as well, because it has been brought up. Um, so it's, it is a form of voter suppression. Again, the narrative is that it will protect from voter fraud, but voter fraud doesn't happen with the frequency that people would lead you to believe. So. Um, so then when we talk about voter engagement, so I'm sure um, you all's plans for voter engagement um, and voter registration have kind of been derailed just like ours um, due to the pandemic. And so um, one of the things that we've had to do is transition some of those activities virtually or do them in other ways. So um, you can see here direct contact voter registration. Technically, it is still an option, obviously following all the CDC guidelines with your mask and your six feet of distance, um, but those can still happen um, if you choose, um, as long as you're following those guidelines. And then there are some alternatives. So these are practical ways in which you or your organization can get involved with voter registration um, beyond meeting with people face-to-face. -face. So some of the things that we've done in Nebraska as a Nebraska League um, and a greater Omaha legal women voters is text and phone banking. So that's definitely an option that you can do. You can utilize that to um, remind people as to those deadlines that I mentioned earlier. Um, we also have a vote for one one platform, which I'll talk about in just a little bit um, and remind people that they can view nonpartisan candidate information. I think that's one of the very important things about the League of Women Voters is that we have nonpartisan information. So we're kind of a trusted voice in the community as to not just voting rights and voter education, but um, candidate information so that we operate in a neutral way. Um, social media ads, we have done that quite a bit as well. Um, we have an ad called Home is Where the Vote is to promote um, voting by mail. And so those types of efforts can really get dialogue going as to, you know, what are the benefits of voting by mail? Is there really fraud? We've had a lot of dialogue and conversation from those um, social media ads that have encouraged people to do more research and learn about the process of voting by mail and, you know, kind of debunk some of those misconceptions. Um, we've also done um, or are looking to do webinars related to voting related topics. And I think that's really important, again, from a voter education standpoint, um, so that people know what, what um, issues that may be going on in their community. And they also can connect that to the elected officials that they're actually voting for. So a lot of things that you hear is that my vote doesn't matter or my vote doesn't count. Um, that's kind of the messaging that you hear at times as far as non-voters. And so 
some of that education can combat some of that. Um, and then obviously advocating for vote by mail, which I talked about earlier, um, really holding public officials accountable for making sure that people participate in democracy and are exercising their civic duty and their right to vote is really important. And then um, something out of Kansas called Voter to Voter um, is a, a platform that they've used. It's relational organizing. So basically, you reach out to your neighbor or your friend or you, someone in your peer group and remind them to vote, check in and make sure they're registered to vote. And it's just kind of a more close knit way and personable way to um, ensure that people are registered to vote and that they have the information that they need. And so there are lots of barriers to voting and voter registration. Um, and so these are just some strategies to address some of those things. So some of the barriers, lack of poll workers, knowledge and accessibility of voting by mail, um, closed polling sites, provisional and nonpartisan ballots and the education around that, um, the belief that's, that their vote doesn't count, and then high school and young adult student registration. So there are lots of strategies you can do to kind of address those things. A couple of them that I want to highlight um, is the idea that we've seen a lot of what I would consider botched elections in um, other states uh, where there's been rampant voter suppression, closed polling sites and things of that nature. So there are ramifications or there are statutes and regulations um, in your state that require your elected official to provide you with the information that a polling site is closed or whatever the whatever the situation might be um, within a certain time frame. So you want to make sure that you're keeping up with some of those things so you can hold those public officials accountable for that. Um, and then addressing the, the my vote doesn't count. So I believe it was an election in Douglas County, Nebraska that was decided by three votes. So bringing up instances like that where, you know, there's a very small margin um, really helps people to understand not only that their vote counts, but also that the issues that they care about, such as systemic racism or poverty or any other issue or climate change, any issue that they care about is determined by a public official. So Chelsea mentioned it earlier that we really are at a place where we can, you know, utilize our public officials to really make change. Um, so making sure that people are aware of that. Um, and then lastly, um, I'll talk a little bit about Vote 411. So if you're not familiar, um, Vote 411 is a platform created by the League of Women Voters National Organization um, that gives candidate information um, to voters uh, so they can plug in their address and it will give them information about candidates on their ballot. So um, most of the states do participate in Vote 411. I know Nebraska and Kansas do specifically. We have some Nebraska and Kansas folks on. So um, it will give you candidate information for the primary and general election. Um, it will give you candidate information, like I mentioned, based off, your, based off of your address. And it will also give you voter registration deadlines that I mentioned. It will help you locate your polling place. And actually in Nebraska, which is something that we're really proud of and has been a lot of work, but really, um, really inspiring is we've actually expanded Vote 411 in Nebraska to all 93 counties. So now you can see election information for candidates in all 93 counties, um, including down ballot races. So that's really exciting. Um, it's something that we've been working on and that we're currently working on to get that information out for the general election. Um, and we've also promoted that voters guide and vote for one one in local newspapers. And that's another opportunity to kind of promote that information in your state um, and also translate it in Spanish as well to make it a little bit more accessible for the uh, communities of color. So how does this connect to climate change? So Chelsea mentioned it earlier, making sure you're reviewing those candidates platforms. So those, those representatives that are running for uh, public, uh, public uh, boards um, that are related to climate change, the NRD boards, for example, and making sure that you're holding them accountable to not only their platform, but to um, pushing forward the things that, that are most pressing as it relates to climate change and any other issue that you would care about. So making sure you're, you're aware of what their positions are and holding them accountable for that. Um, and then determining organizations that you can collaborate with. So we're stronger together, right? So if you can find organizations that you can collaborate with and advocate with and connect kind of the environmental justice piece that Janelle and Megan talked about 
with um, racial justice, for example, with everything that's going on currently, I think you will have a larger coalition of people to advocate for the issues that you care about. Um, and then distributing communications, again, that directly relate to communities of color or any other demographic, faith-based communities um, that will really show them what the importance of the, the climate and the environment is on generations going forward and on um, just making you know, our world a better place. So um, I have some links here as well that I can send out and there are plenty more. So just let me know um, what you need and I can send that out to you. And here is our information. So if you want to visit our website, we have a new website coming out on July 15th, shameless plug. Um, so uh, that's exciting, um, but feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And that's it for me. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Tony. I will say that uh, the Kansas, I was looking on the Kansas League of Women Voters website uh, the other day after I talked to Seal and I thought I was really impressed. I also, I think, you know, one thing I learned when I talked to Seal is that her husband did almost all the, is that right? He did almost all the wind mapping for Kansas in the late 70s. Yes, he uh, developed the Kansas wind map was still being used. Isn't that cool? And yeah. worked on several wind farm developments. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Kansas uh, has 20, or excuse me, 41% of its electricity powered by wind. Yeah. I think the uh, southeast of uh, power pool though is uh, one clog in getting it uh, transferred back east, you know, to Missouri or, um, but yeah, Tony did a great job of covering all sorts of information there. Thank you. Big applause for, for all of our presenters. That was really, really good. Yes. Okay, um, so to transition from that, and if there are any questions, I wasn't necessarily monitoring the chat when I was presenting, I'm sorry. Um, but if there are questions, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to answer some questions. Um, so what we'll do now is break out into um, groups that have been pre-assigned to you. Um, so if you'll give me just like two minutes to make sure and then we will um, go into your breakout session. So a window will pop up letting you know to join um, the, the breakout room and then you'll be shuffled in there and we'll go from there. So two seconds. I wish I had Jeopardy music to play. <laughs>
and you'll go to our page. And then I want, I encourage you to scroll to the bottom because we are hoping that United Methodist Congregations in Kansas and Nebraska will start the process of becoming creation care churches. And it's a fairly easy process, but it is described on our creation care page. Again, that's greatplainsumc.org backslash creation care. So that's just a plug. There is a project, there's a process for United Methodists to become more involved in creation care. Oh yeah, I'll post it. Thanks, Lilia. Okay, anyone, anyone from Nebraska have anything that they came up with in their breakout session that they wanna share? Um, I can go for, we had all Nebraska in our group. One thing that a couple people recognized or realized with that was that Nebraska is a public power district and that we can vote for those officials. So I think in the future, they're gonna look out for, for those candidates and who they can vote for in those races. So thank you, Chelsea, for pointing that out. Yeah, anybody from Kansas have any thoughts or any discussions that you all had related to your specific climate? This is Lori. I didn't go to a, a, a group with other Kansans. I only went to a group with somebody who was on a telephone that I couldn't unmute. So I have no idea what we were supposed to do or anything. Okay. So there were other Kansans. Yeah. In Kansas. Technology. That'd be great. <laughs> I would love to hear from you. Yeah. If there's anyone else um, from Kansas that uh, discussed anything that they feel like is specific to I, I also was in a group with only Nebraskans. I, I believe I was the only Kansans, but uh, uh, yes, we presentations that you feel like is relatable that you can take with you. Well, I think um, I was interested in, in the contrast between Nebraska and Kansas. Uh, the one good factor that we do have in Kansas is that with our new Democratic governor, she will be appointing and has now appointed two people on our Kansas Corporation Commission. It's a panel of three, and they set the they review you know, how much utilities want and payment and uh, policies, and uh, so even on the wind uh, and solar. You know, last year they changed the solar power so that uh, utilities can charge those people solar power more money than they had in the past, and so our, our KCC members are very important, and we're getting we have two new ones on there now, so that's really great. All my uh, okay. Real quick, before you start the movie, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, my name is Jessica Palace, and I'm not part of, this was a fabulous program. Thank you to everybody who did it. I'm part of the UCC in Nebraska, and I've heard about the creation here quite a bit through Tom Janong, who's a member of my church and also on this call. Um, last year, we in our church in Hastings created a climate change <laughs> Um, a climate change focused uh, Sabbath, Creation Care Sabbath, and I think we pulled some of the Methodist resources, so thank you for that. But then I'm on the board, so we plan to do it statewide. Um, and so I have this Sabbath toolkit that we plan to do for next spring, and I think everything for this fall is critical and important, and we're all going to work on this election. But I'd love to have a conversation with some of the uh, leads on this call, a uh, Zoom conversation later about could we work as one body and use utilize those things at one time, maybe around Earth Day. I'm a former community organizer, so we've done this before with faith-based groups where um, you can get a lot of media and a lot of press if we all kind of do one thing at one time, like we all have a Sabbath kind of thing. Anyways, I sent emails to Tony and I'd love to send one to Mrs. Indrum and is it Linda Duckworth? Anyways, my email I'll send Tony will have it. If anyone is willing to have that conversation, I'd really like to plan that. Yeah. Will do. Sounds great. Um so now on to the, the, the feature presentation, uh the closing um video. And yes, before we do that, um before everyone leaves. So um, I do have a list of everyone that registered for this. So if there's anyone in particular that you'd like to coordinate with, um, I can 
make that happen. And then we'll also provide the resources and information that we presented during the presentation to you all as well. Um, and our contact information, again, I can send that out to everyone that attended as well. So thank you all for being present, for your attention and for your engagement and just passion about the issues. Obviously you all are present because you care. So we appreciate that. Okay. It's come, every nation come, all my relations under the sun, we are one. We are praying, come. We are praying, come. We are song and we are the drum. We are one. We are the river, come. We are the river, come. We are the boat, the paddle. We are one. Many were choni sing to Kuyoya. Many were choni sing to Kuyoya. Many were choni water. Yes, I pour everything for yes. We are the water sing to Kuyoya. We are the water sing. We are the water, we are the water, we are the ancient one, we are the ancient one, in your breath and bones we sing on, we are one, we are the meadow. We are the meadow come. We are the life that sings the new day has begun. We are the new day, run, run, run. We are the new day, run, run, run. We are the old and we are the young. We are one. Many which only sing to Kuyoyas, many which only sing to Kuyoyas, many which only water is for everything Kuyoyas. We are the water sing to Kuyoyas, we are the water sing to Kuyoyas, we are the water we we are the earth and sky, we are the thunder cries, we are the fire, we are the light in your eyes. We are standing strong. Like a rock, like a stone, on the sacred ground we belong. We are home. All our relations come. Every nation come. All our relations under the sun. We are one. Oh, my Yay. <laughs> that was so good. Okay, well, that concludes our presentation, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your attendance, and we will be in touch with information and availability to collaborate with you, hopefully, on these issues. So thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.